open to uh, this webinar um, around connection and making sure that you are communicating effectively for the person who you're caring for. And if you aren't caring for someone, these tips uh, around just connecting and, and communicating generally help to diffuse and reduce stress which we know is helpful in terms of learning and that, that higher brain function of creativity, productivity, and reducing stress just generally helps our, our brain and reduces the risk associated with that long-term stress over time and the buildup of cortisol, its effect on the hippocampus and the amygdala, these parts of the brain center, that the center of the brain that's really um, the kind of center of memory and learning. So, Let's get going here. The just quick little um, pieces about housekeeping pieces. The replays will be available because you have signed up for this webinar. You will be on the email list. You will be emailed a replay. So if you miss some of it or you have to jump off, don't worry. You will get another replay. You will get the link to the replay. And then we're going to have time for questions after. Please put your questions in the Q&A. There's plenty in the chat, um, space in the chat to introduce yourselves. Uh, and Tyler is here. She'll answer as many questions as she can along the way as well. But anything that you have specifically for me, go ahead and put it in that Q&A section. And that's where I'm going to look first at the end of the presentation. So the idea and what, what I do and what I've committed my professional career, my career to here is making sure that you get the support that you need. You're here because you either are concerned that you may develop dementia. Maybe you've had a parent, lost a parent who's had dementia in the past and you supported them through it or another loved one. You may already be starting to notice those early stages of cognitive decline. And so you're looking to prevent any further decline and maybe even optimize your, your cognitive function and get it back. Or maybe you're caring for someone with relatively severe dementia and you are looking for those extra tips and tricks and support to help care for them better. And so my goal, because I, I've learned from Dr. Bredesen, his approach, and it, that we have learned that it is complex and there's a lot of pieces to it. My professional goal is to get you, no matter what position you're in, the support that you need to implement this protocol. Because I firmly believe, based on everything I've seen clinically and at Marama, the residential care facility, that nearly everyone can prevent dementia. And most people can absolutely reverse their cognitive decline. And so I am very, very committed to getting everyone the resources that they need so that they can do the work that it takes to get those benefits. And I'm excited to be able to share a piece of that tonight with you. Um, this is Dr. Bredesen at our open house for Marama when we first opened. This was in February of 2020, right before the pandemic. And I felt so fortunate. I continue to feel extremely fortunate um, that he's so supportive. He and I are partnering again with Dr. Perlmutter this year to put on another summit. And um, there's so much in the news. I mean, just yesterday, I think, or over the weekend, there was another drug that got FDA approval. And so Dr. Bredesen and I actually discussed that medication, the leucanumab, um, and, and the aducanumab, the, the aduham, which had been approved through very controversial means um, by the FDA, kind of a preliminary approval. Uh, we discuss all that and some of the nuances around that and how that fits into using the Bredesen protocol and what that might look like in the future. So all of these things are changing. The reason I bring that up is because it's all changing so quickly. And yet there's a ton that we know and that we can use that we can put to work right now. We don't have to wait. So that next summit, sorry that we don't have our new 2023 logos up and, and line up yet. We're just finalizing it right now but that's gonna go live June 13th. So make sure you're signed up for that if you want to be able to listen to all of those brand new recordings. So I wanted to share just some of my inspiration um, for why I do this. And really it's the people, it's the people whose lives change and whose stories I, I have the privilege of hearing. It's a really vulnerable kind of intimate time um, when you're caring for someone with dementia and Bob and Mary are, Bob is a patient of mine and he came in with his wife. They live here in Encinitas right on the beach. And she has really struggled in communicating with him because 
of, you know, she wants so, she loves him so much and she wants so badly for him to get better. And yet they tend to butt heads and she gets really frustrated when he doesn't remember something. And she says, don't you remember? I just told you this. And even in our visits, when she joins him for a visit, she will be kind of, you know, just kind of giving him a hard time about what he isn't remembering, what he's not doing. Like, listen, the doctor is telling you, you have to walk more. You have to, you have to get your heart rate up. You need to do those classes. And in kind of watching their dynamic, I could see his stress level going up and up and up and up as we were having this conversation. And we, I asked him, you know, if you could, if you could wave a magic wand, what would life look like these days? What would you want to do? What would you want to be engaged in? Because he understands, like when we talk about it, he gets it. He's like, I want to do the exercise. I want to get to sleep on time. I want to wear my CPAP. I want to take the supplements. But then day to day, when she's trying to get him to do it, he's resisting. And what came up, he said, I wish I could just connect with her the way we used to. And this was just a really heartwarming moment for me because she heard him. She totally heard him. She said, oh, what he wants is for me to connect with him, not correct him. And that's the invitation tonight. And it was in that moment that I was like, connection over correction. That's, that is the mantra of this. And it was Mary who kind of said it and realized she had this moment of realization that even if we're just walking together on the beach, like we are connecting and that's what is most important and valuable to him. And that is what is going to help him get better and probably be less resistant to everything that she is trying to fit into their day. So I want to give you some tips about how to do that because it's not always easy. And Mary struggles with this still, um, but her in her mind, she's catching herself more often and she's stopping herself from that correction and focusing back on love and connecting. Um, this is really challenging. Uh, I'm going to talk about releasing expectations first here. So we have at, at Marama, I'll just start this by saying at Marama, we have this luxury of the people who live there are not our family. It's not our mom, not our spouse. It's not someone that we have decades of experience with and all these built up resentments and memories and all of the things that come with being a family. At Marama, we have a clean slate and we fully appreciate that it's their disease process that is causing these behaviors. And so releasing the expectation of who this person is going to be, your mom might not be that person that you can lean on for help anymore. She might not be the person who can create a Thanksgiving dinner for 20 people and get everything right. She's going to need more support from you. And your husband might not remember the thing that you just told him earlier this morning about taking out the trash. And that's just because they don't remember. And so asking them to remember is really, really hard on them. And so letting go of those expectations and potentially just asking again or being there to provide support. So authenticity, be authentic. Let them know if you love them, let them know and let that be the place you start from and let that be what you continue to remind them. Empower people. So giving them, if, if they've always folded laundry and that's familiar to them or they've always done the dishes, Maybe let them at least pretend to do those things or get, give them the towels and the socks and the pillowcases and the things, the flat sheet, not the, not the fitted sheet, the things that are super simple and easy to do that might give them that sense of empowerment, of completion. Um, and then meeting them in that place of where they are, where they're, they're kind of at their edge of capability, but still feeling like they can contribute. Having compassion along the way for both yourself and for the other person, this assumption that we're all doing the best we can. And certainly if you are here, you are doing so much to help your loved one. And then curiosity. So oftentimes when interesting behaviors come up, I won't necessarily call them challenging, but we've had a resident at Marama who will sleep underneath her bed. So on the wood floor under her bed, she'll put on all of her clothing, layer after layer after layer, and then she will sleep under the bed. And there has been a curiosity for a while, and we haven't quite figured this one out yet, but we have a curiosity. What is the need that's not being met? 
Is she anxious that someone's going to walk into her room and find her in her bed? We don't know yet. We're, we're trying to understand what need she is trying to meet by putting on all of her clothes and crawling into the bed. And when we have a curiosity about that, we might be able to meet that need in a creative way so that they no longer feel the need to, to uh, um, accommodate that in sometimes very peculiar ways. There's a book um, called The Four Agreements by, I think it's Don Ruiz, and he says um, there, these four agreements basically make a, for a, a better lived life. So to always do your best, again, the fact that you're even here, that you're showing up to learn this piece of the puzzle for caring for someone with dementia and preventing dementia, you are doing your best, right? You're here to learn, you're looking to grow, you're looking to do an even better job. And so I can, I can appreciate that you probably are doing the best you can. And everyone in the situation is, including the person with dementia, they're doing the best they can. Take nothing personally. And again, this is that advantage that we have over at Marama is that we don't take it personally because it isn't personal. And we know it's not personal because we don't have any of that backstory. So letting that backstory go as much as possible, being in the moment and not taking it personally is hugely freeing. Be impeccable with your word. So again, the uh, those suffering with dementia, they still have emotion. We had a recent incident uh, at the new facility in Kansas where uh, we had someone move in and they didn't know they were moving in. So they hadn't been told by their family member who supported them in getting them there, but she didn't understand what was going on. And so that put, that made her very anxious. She was totally confused. And there's an emotion of sort of abandonment. And so being really upfront with your word, being clear and communicating, everyone, excuse me, still has feelings even though they might not retain their short-term memory, there's a feeling. Uh, we, uh, again, another example from a resident who lived at Marama. Um, at the very beginning, we actually, she lived there when we, when we took over the facility and she was in her late nineties. Her children were in their sixties and seventies and her son passed away before she did, just a few months before she did. And her daughter made a decision to not tell her mom. Her mom had dementia and um, had short-term memory loss, but she knew that her mom would remember the feeling of sadness of learning that her son had passed away and the likelihood of her remembering that he didn't show up to see her was almost zero. So sharing that information just didn't make sense. It wasn't compassionate. It wasn't the right thing to do. And I thought that that was a great um, example of being impeccable with your word. Sometimes it's about the things that we don't say and we don't share. And then not making assumptions. This kind of goes back to being curious. Like, why is there this behavior? Instead of assuming it's because someone is mad at you or they have an agenda, it might just be that they need to pee and they're feeling really uncomfortable. And so that's why they're a little short. And they don't remember how to express that, or they don't even remember that that sensation in their bladder is telling them that they need to go to the ladies' room. So being curious and keeping keeping that that story open. What what could be going on here? Here are some resources that I lean on. So if we can kind of create this foundation, I mentioned this from the very get go. We don't learn when we're under stress. We can't think clearly when we're under stress, right? And so what we're asking for is a reversal of cognitive decline. We need to learn. We need to be able to think clearly. We cannot be under a tremendous amount of stress. We, what we want the stress to be is that little bit of cognitive stress, that little bit of maybe physical exertional stress. That is where we're going to see the magic happen. We don't want the stress of feeling anxious, of feeling abandoned, of feeling unloved, of feeling lonely, of feeling isolated, of feeling hungry or hot or cold. We want the stress to just be that bit of cognitive engagement and physical engagement at your edge. So when we reduce stress at any opportunity, including an engagement with our loved ones, we increase the connection, then we can increase the joy and increase the, the cognitive capacity of the person that we're caring for. So Tipa Snow, she has uh, many, many, many YouTube videos. And um, when you start watching them, you might find that I have gotten a lot of value from looking at her, watching her videos. I interviewed her. 
um, last year for the summit and she's on again this year and she's just fantastic. So she has a, a um, organization called a positive a approach to care and she trains caregivers and she actually trained many of the caregivers at the Clear Mind Center in Kansas that we just opened. So she's phenomenal and her resources online are, are great. Many of them are free. And then if you want to engage with her, you can. And then this book, Learning to Speak Alzheimer's, is another one that I've gotten a ton from. Um, Joanne Koenig Coste, she, her husband developed Alzheimer's um, in his 50s when she's, or maybe his 40s even, when she still had kids in diapers. And so she has a ton of firsthand experience of what it's like to care for someone with dementia. And then once after he had passed away, she actually went on to train people in facilities in this connection over correction sort of approach. She calls it a habilitation approach. And she was really one of the first people to popularize this idea that if there's a resident in a facility who starts talking about having breakfast with their mom who passed away 20 years ago, instead of reminding them that their mother passed away, you meet them in their world. You say, oh, what did you and mom have for breakfast? What did it smell like? What did it taste like? And you just have them describe their world to you and show genuine interest. And you, you might end up hearing some pretty funny stories. So Alzheimer's communication, this actually comes from a woman named Rem, uh, Renee uh, Harmon. And take a picture of this. If you're here looking for language that you can use with a loved one, instead of arguing, try agreeing, right? So instead of arguing that your mom didn't have breakfast with you, what did you have with your mom? Agree and then engage, connect. Use that as uh, whatever they're, they're describing to you. Use that as an opportunity to connect, as a bid for connection. Instead of reasoning, try diverting. So if they happen to be doing something super dangerous, um, then just take their attention elsewhere. And maybe that's through a, a food or a smell or, hey, a cat or a dog or an animal that they love, or a, maybe a child, a flower. Uh, diverting or, or redirecting is sometimes what we call this. And this is a really helpful strategy because where you can kind of use that short-term memory loss because uh, they can be distracted, they might forget what they were trying to do. But if you keep reinforcing it by trying to reason with them about why or why not they should or shouldn't do something, you're just going to run in circles. Instead of shaming, try distracting. Instead of lecturing, try reassuring. Instead of saying, remember, such and such, try reminiscing and describing Instead of saying, hey, mom, remember when you used to make me those apple pies? Say, do you, I love the smell of cinnamon. Apples in the fall, they're so crisp and juicy. Those ones that are on our tree that you make apple pie with. And then oftentimes, if it's a familiar enough kind of story that you, you start to tell, they might jump in and say, oh, yeah, you used to love my apple pie. That kind of thing, you can create connection. And then instead of saying, I told you, I told you to take out the trash. Would you please take the trash out for me, Bob? And just say it again, repeat yourself. Instead of saying, you can't drive anymore, try stating what you, they can do. Peter can come over and take you to the store. Peter can come over and take you to, car, to the card game. Someone can come pick you up or... We, we can we can go together instead of reinforcing what they can't do. Instead of demanding, try asking. Instead of condescending, try encouraging. Instead of forcing, try reinforcing the positive things that they're doing. These are those are all some kind of tactics for focusing on this gem. So the idea, and this comes out of Tipa Snow's work, is that you want to focus on what is precious and unique about that person. You want to create an environment and activities and, and, and a whole relationship where you're focused on what they have instead of what's missing. And many people, some people, as they progress through the dementia phases, 
they actually become better painters or more creative. They might become funnier. And so focus on those things that are positive and on what is there versus what isn't. And create a setting so that they shine bright. Remember everyone, again, I cannot say this enough. Remember everyone is doing the best they can, including you, both the patient and you. So a lot of compassion and forgiveness. So these gems, the idea, and, and Tipa goes into them uh, quite a bit more. She has these kind of the rubies and the diamonds and the sapphires and the emeralds and how they each behave a little bit differently. And there are different ways that you can shine them. You can basically support them um, in, by using different types of language based on the personality types or the characteristics that are coming out. And you can make sure that they're in a place where the best of them is going to shine the brightest. So here are a few phrases. Again, you might want to take a quick picture of this. Um, that these are things that you want at the tip of your tongue. So to diffuse, apologizing is often very, very helpful. And again, remember, it's not about being right or wrong. It's about diffusing the situation. And it's the feeling that that person has. So saying, I'm sorry, I was trying to help. Often we are trying to help, right? And then they get agitated and angry because it's misinterpreted. Other times they become angry. Um, I'm sorry, I made you angry, right? That that was, expressing that that wasn't your intention, slowing down. Um, some of Tipa's suggestions are grabbing the hand from their dominant side and then getting below them. So this is just animalistic. This is a less aggressive posture. This is connecting physically. There's warmth in the hand, which can be relaxing. So the muscles can start to relax throughout the body. And then be crouching down from their dominant side, uh, holding their dominant hand, looking in their eyes and sincerely saying, I'm sorry, I embarrassed you. I'm sorry, I treated you like a child. I'm sorry, I know this is hard. I know this is hard on us both. Acknowledging those things can often diffuse a situation and allow that person to relax and then respond to whatever the request is, whatever it is they're trying to get them to do next. And then this is a prayer um, that, again, very powerful, a, li a little different version of this is, I'm sorry, I love you, please forgive me, thank you. Repeating that over and over while looking in someone's eyes is extremely powerful. And it, with, it, when delivered with sincerity, can diffuse most situations and even create a lot of healing. Um, forgiveness is extremely healing. And these, um, these situations can be so challenging. Caring for someone with dementia can be so exceptionally challenging, but there's often little things to be forgiven for. Okay, so Chris, I wanted to just share another success story. Chris is, a, again, a patient of mine who did all of this at home with, with our help. And you can see that her MOCA score went from, I think it was about 22, 23, and it went all the way up to 30 over the course of 12 months. And she was even at like 27, I think, uh, at six months. So she was well on her way. She was brighter and happier and remembering so much more. She had so much energy. She didn't feel flustered anymore. Chris is actually still working as a nurse. She was working in the operating room and her cognition was, was um, measurably impaired, right? She was at a 22, 23. She was having trouble, certainly learning new systems on the electronic health record that they used. The only reason she was still able to work was because she knew it so well. She'd been doing it for so long. It was just so routine but she struggled to put her chart notes in. She noticed things were taking her a lot longer. So she was having to work longer hours. And she also um, was having to ask a lot of questions and get reminders for things. And this was really a struggle both at home and especially at work. And so we saw her cognition improve significantly over the course of, of six and then even 12 months. And we also measured her EEG. So we did a... a um, it's called a wavi, and it, we put electrodes on the skull, on the scalp. Nothing goes in. We're just measuring what's going on with the brain waves and the voltage and your reaction times. And what we saw for Chris was that her voltage started around seven, and ideal voltage voltage is around fourteen. So this is the amount of energy that our brain is making. This is important for all of cognition, right? This is a, a little bit about how quickly we compute 
excuse me, how quickly we compute things, but also our brains, even though they're only 2% of our body weight, they consume 20% of the energy that we use every day in our body. So the, that proportion far outweighs the actual physical weight of the organ itself, of the brain. And so we need tons of energy in the brain. And when we're only making about half of what we should be, we can feel it. We feel it in energy. We feel it in that, that brain fog. We feel it in, in being able to remember somebody's name. We just don't have the resource to do it because we're not making enough ATP or that energy currency that cells run on. And so you can see that over six months, Chris got to a pretty optimized voltage level. And then these are reaction times. So her, the blue line here that's headed down is the physical reaction time. So what we do is with the Wabi, you have the, this hat on and then you you click a button when you hear a high pitched beep. So there's a low pitched beep going in the background. And then when you hear that high pitched beep, you click the mouse. And the physical reaction time is how long it takes for your brain to send the signal to your finger and for your finger to do that work of clicking the mouse. And you can see that as she had more energy, that uh, time came down and it was faster and faster and faster. So we want this curve to be going down. We want it to be getting quicker and quicker and quicker. And that's a little bit of what we saw with her brain's reaction time as well. She was doing a little bit of detoxifying. She was actually still working nights at this point at three months. And so she, she, I think she actually even was still at six months. She didn't finally get rid of her night shift until 12 months. But she, um, her overall, her brain reaction time, she's thinking much more quickly. She's reacting to stimuli from the environment much sooner. And this, how does this play out in the real world? Not just beeps on the computer when you're being hooked up. But this is that reaction time that it takes to, you know, change your posture as you trip over the curb. This is that reaction time if you're driving a vehicle and you need to slam on your brakes or get out of the way. This is that reaction time that keeps you from falling down the stairs and readjusting or from touching something hot. This is really critical to keeping us independent. And so that's part of why we measure it. And it's also another way to show outside of those cognitive tests the brain function is improving. So really exciting stuff. I also want to share, if you weren't here last week, that this um, last coaching session, so we've had 75 or 80 people or so go through our coaching program, which has been amazing. And um, Joe shared with us the spreadsheet. He is an engineer caring for his wife who has dementia. And he did this fabulous job of putting together these spreadsheets. And it's kind of like a sample of a schedule for one week for how he is engaging his wife and all of the pieces that we can kind of put together to optimize the Bredesen program. So as a, as a member of our coaching program, you would get a copy of this that you could then plug into and um, make work for you. So super, super helpful. And one of those incredible things that comes out of being in this group coaching is that you get to learn from people like Joe, other people who are doing this, who are, um, are, are putting their heart and soul into caring for their loved one. And it was really neat because Joe, Joe learned a lot. He's an engineer, so he's very focused on doing everything perfectly and having it all measured. And, and uh, he's very impressive. And he was dancing with his wife and it felt like, it felt a little bit like work. It felt like checking a box. And someone reminded him that it's really important to connect and to feel that sense of romance, even as your partner is declining cognitively to remind them how much you love them in that way. Um, and that that's really helpful. And so he was, he was inspired hearing that feedback from others. Um, all right, so I wanna share what we're offering, which is the, the coaching, the live coaching with me, but that includes an 11 module caregiver training course that's valued at $497. And we have that, um, occasionally we do that just on its own and that'll be available around the time of the summit and with the summit. And then there's 12 live coaching sessions with me. So this is each week for an hour, we go through the different, excuse me, sorry about that. We go through the, the 11 different modules, and then we have one extra week to really put it all together, make sure we're answering everyone's questions, that everybody's had a chance to speak their piece and share their story and make sure that we're getting them the optimized and individualized uh, support that they need. 
And we are also, we have this private Facebook group that's valued at $500 where you can, you know, if you have that question that comes up at midnight, you can't remember during the, the live call, or you didn't remember it during the live call, or it wasn't pertinent on Wednesday, but now it's Sunday, and you want to get some feedback, you get that not only from us, but also from the group, from everyone else who has been in these coaching calls um, and, and who is maybe a little bit further ahead of you in the program, or maybe they're doing a piece that you're not and you're ahead of them and you can support them in some way. You also get a one-on-one -on -one call with me. So I absolutely love these. This really helps us to prioritize and figure out how to make this program really, really beneficial for you. So we're making sure that there is a money back guarantee. So you can purchase this course and any time in the first 30 days after you purchase, it, no questions asked, you can have your money back if it's not the right program for you. We really, really want people to make sure it's the right program for them. It's a unique offering because of this group facilitation and also systematically going through these different pieces of the Bredesen protocol with everything that I've learned from the clinic as well as from Marama. So um, we really want to make sure that this is something you're going to get a huge amount of value out of and you're going to get that community, this really incredible community and the goal setting. So if, if we have a goal of implementing the Bredesen protocol, it's so important to have those other people there to hold you accountable. We're about 30% likely to achieve a goal if we just say it out loud or just say it to ourselves. We become 60% more likely to achieve that goal if we write it down in our own handwriting. So you might wanna do that right now. Write down your goal, what transformation you are looking for as you think about maybe in, uh, engaging in this course. And then we're about 90% able to reach these goals, especially if they're behavior modification, if we engage community. So if we tell someone else that we're planning to do it, all of a sudden it makes it a lot easier to achieve that goal. So we want to, you to be in, in this community of people who are dedicated to reversing Alzheimer's just like you are. And I never want you to sit in confusion again. You're not alone. There is a process. There's a way that we can reverse dementia. And we are here to support you through that process of implementing this. It's really about those choices, those little choices we make every day about what we eat, what time we go to bed, whether or not we take a moment of mindfulness, how much activity we get. These things and those choices that we make every single day, they all add up to our brain health, to our whole body health. We want to help you make sure that you're making the right choices every day. And I also want you to feel like you're doing everything that you can based on the science, that we know a lot about what we can do to reverse and, and prevent Alzheimer's and that you're doing everything that you can. So what we're offering is the Marama at Home course, which comes with this, of course, and you'll have instant access. And then we start the coaching next week. This happens uh, on Wednesday at 3.30. So we're starting on May 17th. I'm really looking forward to meeting you all. We already, the course is almost full. So make sure that you take advantage of this today. Um, and then there's a private Facebook group that you'll get and a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. And we, we sort those out as fast as we can to do those coaching calls so that we can make sure that I know you from the beginning. Um, and we can fine tune the course and individualize it to make sure we're meeting your needs. And that is only $2,497, excuse me, $2,497 instead of $7,897 in value. So we, and we're going to do this again after the next summit. We had over 55,000 registrants last year for the summit. We have 80,000 people on our email list, and we're expecting to have eight, around 80,000 people registered this year. So these courses will sell out. And um, because my time is limited, we will likely raise the cost. The other thing that you will get, although I don't know the timeline on this, is we are developing an app, so a mobile app that you'll have on your phone where you'll be, you'll get daily reminders. You'll get three recipes a day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, plus two snacks. You'll also have access to reminders about uh, and instructions. You'll have a, basically a daily schedule of what we do at Marama so that you can see, okay, here's a brain uh, engaging activity, a brain stimulating activity, like a crossword puzzle or Sudoku. Here's a creative activity, like a painting project or a birdhouse with 
links to all the resources that you need to make that happen. There's also guided meditations and other and suggestions for games and resources for games after dinner. So we take you through the entire day so that you can feel like you are doing everything that you possibly can to reverse and prevent dementia. And so we're really excited to share that. And that will be shared for free with anybody who's in the coaching classes. We're hoping to have that ready by June 1st. So if you're like Sharon and you want to help other people, this could be the class for you. So Sharon signed up because she is a nurse. She's a nurse um, and she's a teacher, an instructor and an administrator. So she teaches other nurses. And in that, she wanted to make sure that her nurses who she, who she is training, that they have the best in the science and they are learning the most advantageous way to support patients in their hospitals who are suffering with dementia. She lost her mom to dementia, and she wishes that there were more nurses and more care providers out there who were talking about these kinds of things, not just saying, hey, are you on your meds? Sorry, there's nothing else we can do. But there were more people engaged and saying, hey, there are lifestyle changes we can make. There are doctors who are trained by Dr. Bredesen. There is hope and there are other things we can do. And she wants to amplify this message that we're sharing through the, the students that she has. And she said, I've enjoyed our sessions tremendously. I've learned so much that is practical and that I can implement in my day to day. So she was also implementing because she wants to prevent Alzheimer's herself. She is APOE4 positive. I'm loving the class. Thank you for offering it. This has been on my mind for years. I'm a nurse and focused on older adults in my capstone paper originally. I love learning about the brain and love being with older adults. I have three children and I was so focused on them for so long, but something about this is extremely important to me. It's bigger than just my mom alone and her memory. This is a humanitarian issue. I love that I'm learning more using the data to drive what we do so we aren't in the dark and guessing. I love focusing on what will actually get us results. So if you're like Sharon and you want to help others by learning this, please, and you want to prevent, please join us. Richard is a patient who came in to see me and then him and his daughter joined the class and they are, um, he, when he came in, he was unable to remember the names of farm animals, remember the names of his grandchildren and through the coaching, they finally got into ketosis. And once he was in ketosis, he was able to remember the names of grandchildren and the farm animals. And it was really, really fun for his daughter to watch. Now, unfortunately, some of her siblings were not as dedicated to the Bredesen approach and to ketosis. So they came into town and fed him pizza and ice cream. And sure enough, he did not do as well and started for, uh, forgetting names. Now, this was just super illustrative for them and for the entire family. So now everybody's on board and making sure that he's only getting the best food um, and that he's staying primarily in ketosis with very, very low levels of sugar in his diet. The, um, I was... Recently at a funeral, and unfortunately, a, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine's um, husband passed away in a car accident, tragically, and she, um, excuse me, her brother, his brother, excuse me, was giving a, a really beautiful eulogy, and he was describing this, these very unique text messages that his brother would send, and how they made him laugh, and he said, what I would give, I would give anything to get one more text message from my brother. And I, um, of course I was crying and just thinking about um, their family losing him so young. And then I thought later, as I was reflecting on the, on the service, that Marama, that this approach, that this Bredesen protocol, is that anything? This is that anything that gets you one more text message, that gets you one more phone call, that gets you one more anniversary, one more summer, one more season of knowing that person at their own, at their best capacity possible, right? We don't always get back to full recovery, but we get those moments of connection when we apply this protocol. And even as people decline, um, there are, there's still this opening, and that, that was really the message of what we were discussing tonight, is there's this opportunity to really still connect with someone even after they've lost their short-term memory capacity. And that happens 
through, through joy, through touch, through all of these things that we don't lose. We don't lose our humanity as we go through this process. We lose our memory and, and not usually all of it. And so there, I was talking to a woman um, recently and she was telling me how lucky she felt to be able to be there for her dad even though it was hard and she was like Lisa, she did not want her kids to go through it. She just felt so grateful that she had that time and that she had the memories of her dad, even when he was struggling with dementia, they had those moments that were joyful and she wouldn't give those memories and those moments up for anything. So Lisa, she joined the course because she had just gone through this with her dad and she watched her mom and dad struggle to take care of her grandmother before them. So it's been through multiple generations and she doesn't want the same for her children. She wants them to have a different fate. She's got two daughters and a son and they've all got kids and she loves all of her grandchildren. And she started noticing after her dad passed that as she started taking care of herself, that she wasn't as sharp as she once was. And um, she took care of her dad for about seven years and she's APOE 3, 4 positive. And so that was really stressful. And she understood that her risk as a caregiver was putting her at even more, um, at, at a higher chance of getting out, of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's in addition to her genetic risk. And so she was looking for support from the course so that she knew she was doing all she could to prevent her kids from having to go through that same thing. So if these people sound like you, this will be a course that you can get a lot of value from, and we're excited to be offering it. Once you're in, you will see this login page, and then on the other side of it, you'll see this, and you can just hit that orange button and start the course at any time. And then, as I said, on May 17th at 3.30 Pacific, the same time as this webinar today, we will start the Q&A and the coaching calls on Zoom. So we'll go through each module that will give us kind of the structure and we'll take questions as they come up so that it's a meaningful process for you and we get all of your questions answered and we'll give you exact steps and specific instructions so you can learn to do this at home and get the benefit of being at Marama but staying home. My goal is that people don't need Marama, that no one wants to move to senior living or into, into a memory care facility. Everyone wants to stay home with their loved ones. They want to stay in the fabric of their communities, contributing to people they know and love. And that is my goal, is to keep people from ever needing to step foot in a memory care facility, whether it's Marama or somewhere else. So you'll do the modules at home, and then we'll get together as a group, answer questions, and go through the activities. And I promise you will get so much value from it, as so many of our previous participants have. I want to say thank you to all of you. This is challenging. And if you're showing up wondering how to communicate with a loved one, I know that you've struggled, that you find value in this because it's been hard. And so let's get started healing together. Let's start on this journey together. I'm so grateful to you for your, your care, your dedication, your perseverance through these hard times, your love and your attention for, um, for the person you are supporting. You are the inspiration and you're, you're why I do my work. And I couldn't be more grateful that you are here showing up. All right, so I'm gonna head over to the Q&A. Please add things there. Um, and excuse me, I'm just switching sh screens here. All right. So from D Dutton, thanks for coming. An individual has confirmed high cognition and executive function, but poor episodic memory. What parts of the protocol would you not apply? I wouldn't actually think of it that way. You would still want to do all of the protocol pretty systematically, um, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, it, everyone's so different. Do you want to figure out where the imbalance is for them? And by doing the protocol, you make sure that you're not missing anything. So I don't, there are many different pathways to the same symptoms. And that's the interesting part is how did we get here? Is it toxic exposure? Is it stress? Is it sleep? Is it blood sugar? You want to do all of it and figure out what took them to poor episodic memory and unwind that. So there's no piece of this that I wouldn't apply. Um, 
Yeah, so there's going to be an app with info. Yes, absolutely. We're hoping to have that um, go live June 1st. And those are um, the, Joe's chart and the app will all be um, available to people in the coaching course. Yes, absolutely. And then in terms of expectations, my husband does not want to exercise, wear his hearing aids or eat any fruits, greens, or vegetables. Do I let it go? Are there other suggestions? He is aware of his short and long-term memory losses and lets me know that. Humor and laughter are a key part of our relationship. I love it. His gems are jokes, finding interesting things on YouTube, and he may not recall what he saw or who he talked to in our nature walks, but he recalls the good feeling of the experience. Carol, it sounds like you're doing a great job. Um, to let it go or other suggestions. My hope is that maybe some of the language that we were discussing today might help that, but there might be a little bit of a different way to interface with him so that instead of correcting him, um, maybe talking about how when you can hear me, I feel like I can connect with you more. And that, you know, that makes me feel good. And I'm sure you could hear me saying the wonderful things about you if you had your hearing aids in. I don't know if that's helpful. Sounds like your nature walks are a good form of exercise and maybe doubling down on those because he's it, it's reinforced by those good feelings. Um, <laughs> I hope that that is somewhat helpful. What can cause sodium to drop? My mom is staying hydrated following the protocol and making lots of and taking lots of supplements. Um, Julie, what comes to me first is she might be too hydrated. There might not be enough salt in her water. So just make sure that she's consuming enough. And then it sounds like she needs to see a provider if she has consistently low sodium, if she needs to be evaluated by a doctor. Um, do you need to sign up by this um, on this program by a specific date if you sign up now? You need to start this program on a specific date if you sign up now. Yes, so this is a 12-week program and it starts May 17th. So then we meet weekly on, on Wednesdays for 12 weeks. Um, if, you, if those times don't work for you, let us know and we'll see if maybe what we could do if most of them work for you, you can probably jump into those weeks you miss in a future one. Can more than one family member watch the modules? Absolutely. If the adult kids need to work together and determine how to take care of mom, yes, yes, yes. One family unit can certainly share the modules. What are your thoughts about a person with mild cognitive impairment ending their life prior to reaching dementia? There's a book. Oh, I think it's called, is it called? What is it called? Does any, um, maybe somebody knows. I just, it's by Amy Bloom, In Love. It's called In Love, a memoir of love and loss. And it's about exactly this. Her and her husband essentially decide that that is what is best. Um, he decides that uh, when he's at a place um, where he can. And they go to Switzerland, um, Switzerland or Austria, and um, he ends his life and she goes with him and that trip is their last hurrah and I'm going to start crying just talking about it. It is so painful. Um, what my thoughts are is that I've seen MCI reversed more often than not. And so my thoughts would be there's a lot of life left to live and that there's not, you there's no reason to assume decline. And so that... Um, yeah, it is called um, In Love by Amy Liu. So there is uh, no reason that I think um, that anyone should feel like their life is over if, they're did, if they are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. That just seems kind of crazy to me based on what I've seen and how much joy, how much connection, how much life is left to live and how many people can fully reverse mild cognitive impairment. Um, there's just so much to do. I know it can feel overwhelming. I know that it can feel really depressing, but we have seen miracles happen over and over and over again. All right, are there more questions from Bev? I'd like to sign up for the upcoming live sessions and coaching course starting next week. I purchased the course materials last year after the summit, but need help make, need help making it all happen. Yeah, we Bev, that happens to many, many, many people. 
would it be possible to adjust the rate? Absolutely, we have an upgrade option. So it's just the difference. Yes, and Tyler can help you. Um, and then you need to retail this program to locked memory care and unlocked assisted living. Their diets are terrible with lots and lots of starchy veggies, sweets, desserts, and snacks. Um, and the other mistakes too. Thank you, Tyler. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we we have thought about this and what the best strategy is. And because I really found so much resistance and so the, such a, a lack of interest in conventional facilities, they're really focused on the bottom line. Many of them are owned by big private equity firms, or you know, they're they've been rolled up into big like um like it's an investment for people, right? To own a fraction of these facilities. It's really um very, very much financially driven. And those are inexpensive foods. And so I, although I get it, like I own businesses, they have to, they have to make money to survive, but they are really focused on cutting costs at those types of places. And so they're not willing to pay for the additional labor and they're not willing to change the diets. They're not willing to like uh, incur, they, they don't want the fall risk because it's associated with liability. So they don't encourage people to, to exercise or get out of their wheelchairs or beds. It's really horrible. And so my hope is that we can change the senior living industry by creating an alternative, making that successful, and then everybody's going to need to come in our direction. Because hopefully people like you who are showing up at a webinar like this, if you do end up in a situation where you need to call a facility and be for your parent or your loved one, you say, hey, do you have a healthy diet for a healthy brain diet? Do you have exercises that are healthy for the brain? Are you following the Bredesen protocol at all? And they'll have to start answering yes, if they want to stay full, if they want to have, um, if they want to have a, an adequate census to, to make it work. And so it's going to be the consumers who shift that by asking for what they want. And so my hope is by creating Marama that will start to threaten them a bit and they'll have to incorporate it. Um, so we'll see. Can someone who is on a blood thinner like Xarelto or Eloquist take NeuroQ with the ginkgo in it? I would discuss that with your provider. Typically it's fine, um, but I would definitely want you to talk to it. Uh, what, you're not going to get it from whoever's managing the Xarelto or the Eloquist. Um, but if you can talk to either um, maybe a, a Chinese medicine um, acupuncturist, someone like that, or if you can chat with a naturopath or a Bredesen trained provider, that would be most helpful. Typically, it's a non-issue. Um, what diet have you found most useful for treating mold? Typically, it's going to be a ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is it's a, a, both a candida diet, so you're getting rid of the mold that might be colonized in the gut. And it's a detoxification diet. So you start to release those fat soluble toxins that are stored in the adipose tissue. And through doing that, um, you, you typically reduce the, the toxic burden of mold and really everything else, Andrew. And uh, Dr. Neil Nathan is who I worked and learned from most closely around treating mold. And that's what he recommends too. It's essentially a carb, low, very low carb diet, high fat, low carb diet. Um, if we only made it to the second webinar, will we have access to the first? Oh yeah, D, um, there are repeat replays. And um, Tyler, if, if you can maybe message Tyler in the chat your at address and she can probably get you that replay link. I think it's up right now um, on maramathome.com forward slash webinar. If you go there, that replay, because today this one hasn't come up yet. So that webinar is there right now. Um, so if you just go to maramathome.com forward slash webinar, you'll find it. All right, if there aren't any other questions, I'm so grateful to you all for being here. Thank you so much for your time and attention. It's been a pleasure and I can't wait to see you at the coaching classes. Take care, bye all.